In this lecture, we're going to be looking at an introduction to differential educational achievement. Now, in order to be able to do this subtopic fully, it's important that you understand how educational achievement is measured. So we're going to look at the various ways in which educational achievement is measured, briefly look at the trends in gender, ethnicity and class, and also look at some of identifying some of the internal and external factors which can affect educational achievement. Now we will go into more detail about the trends and the, the internal and external factors within each social group later uh, in the next series of lectures. Today is just kind of an introduction to give you an overview and a baseline knowledge. We're going to start by looking at some key terminology um, that's important for you to know. So when we're talking about educational achievement, what we're referring to is the qualifications, the levels, the grades, the GMVQs, BTECs, whatever it is that you've done, that you are that you achieve at each end at, sorry, at the end of each formal education stage. So at the moment in the UK, that would be end of key stage two, end of key stage four, and end of key stage five. We don't tend to look at um, university level because there is no consistency in the um, degrees that are taught. Each university will have their own course, their own assessment process, and their own system of allocating the um, classifications. It's not Essentially, universities are private institutions. They're not controlled by government um, policy like schools are. So when we're talking about educational achievement, we're talking about the um, achievement of students at the end of each formal stage of education, key stage two, key stage four and key stage five. When we're talking about differential educational achievement, we're talking about looking at how different groups within society um, and what their levels of educational success are. Now that could be um, what, the, what our exam board um, says that we need to look at, which is gender, ethnicity and social class, but it could be expanded to any one of the CADGES groups um, or any other subgroup within that. So it's a wide area but we at A level tend to focus, we will focus on gender, ethnicity and social class because that's what the example would tell us. But with social class, it is difficult to determine social class. There's so many different ways that we could do that. So what sociologists tend to do is they tend to use the term advantaged and disadvantaged students. So that way it's some form of quantifiable and consistent measure of who is who essentially. So what they refer to as the disadvantaged, so they qualify the disadvantaged and anyone else is the advantaged really. Um, the disadvantaged are those who qualify for free school meals or have done in the previous six years. Any children who are looked after or previously looked after, so that could be foster care, adoption, private fostering within families, um, any children who are formerly not living with their biological parents um, and finally children whose parents are in the armed services. Now the reason they include the armed services is a lot of time children in um, these families might move around a lot they, when different with different deployments. Um, they may not have particularly, I don't know, it sounds awful, but it's a particularly stable fat home life due to lots of moving and things like that so it's not saying that they're in an abusive family or anything like that but the stability may not be there due to the amount of moving that can occur with um, children in the armed services so when we're talking about class and we're talking about middle class and working class what we're really talking about is what sociologists refer to as the advantaged and the disadvantaged students Okay, so let's get into looking at how educational achievement is measured. There are lots and lots of ways that this can be done. Um, we're just going to look at a few of them 
and the main ones that are used and they're used by media by government by schools by sociologists but there are a multitude of ways of doing it um, the most common one is raw grades looking at the SATs levels achieved, the number of GCSEs or A-level grades that are either four to five to nine or A star to C. So it's really just a percentage of, so at Key Stage 2, for example, the number, this, um, the percentage of students who achieve a level six in a particular subject, English, math, science, whatever it is. Um, at GCSE, it tends to be the number of four or fives to nines. Now, there are a number, the, the, the reason why I've done the four or five is that um, when it comes to GCSE grades, if you get a grade one, you still have a GCSE in that subject. You just don't have a very good grade in it. Okay, just like if you get an E at A level, you still got an, e, an A level in that subject, you just don't have a very good grade in it. Um, but schools are measured on either grade four, which is the equivalent to a C grade, or a five, which is like a C plus. So a four is like a good pass, a five is a very good pass. And you will see schools that will measure on four, four to nines, some will measure on five to nines, and the government kind of um, does both um, comparatively. Um, with A levels, it's the number of A stars to Cs. Now, in some cases, they look at A stars, we, we, they break it down as well. How many A stars to As, how many A stars to Bs, how many A stars to Cs, how many A stars to Es. So, for example, in A level sociology, I have had 100% A star to E for the last five years, which is um, how long the specifications been in place. Um, I've had over 90% a star to C. Now I'm, I'm not going to get 100% A star to C because there's always going to be extraneous variables that I'm not going to be able to um, account for. And um, so there, there's never, I don't aim for 100% A star to C. I aim for students getting the best grade possible, but that's just me. Um, but schools will promote in their literature the, um, what their percentage four to five to nines are, the percentage A star to C is, and these grades will play into where schools are placed on the league table. So one of the measures that is used to determine position in league table is the raw percentage of grades. Now, if we look at the trends in percentage of grades, what we see is that girls do tend to outperform boys. Not in all subjects, because there are still subjects which are more male heavy or more female heavy. Um, but in general, when we look at the overall trend, girls are achieving better GCSE grades than boys. Um, and we'll look more to why that is when we look at gender and educational achievement. In terms of ethnicity, we see that Chinese and Indian um, students tend to be above average, whereas black, Romanian traveller students tend to be a below, uh, below average. However, that gap is narrowing rapidly. So although um, black and Romani students are below average, the, the, the gap there is getting smaller. And in actual fact, we're, what we're seeing recently is that working class white boys are the lowest achieving group when it comes to raw GCSE um, and A-level grades. Now, in terms of class, unsurprisingly, middle class students outperform working class students. And this is determined by those eligible for free school meals or are plaque or lack. Plaque being previously looked after children, lack looked after children. So we know from looking at Marxism and looking at um, the role and function of education, the, the education system tends to be aimed more towards the middle classes. So it's not surprising to see that those students tend to achieve higher raw grades than working class students. Now, this is where we start getting into the more complicated systems. And these are relatively new. They were introduced by um, Michael Gove when he was education secretary. 
Um, and this is looking at what has been referred to as the EBAC or Progress and Attainment 8. So if we look first at Attainment 8, what Attainment 8 is, and this only applies to GCSE, okay? So what they do is they take the um, eight subjects within the people take at GCSE and they're broken down into three groups. Group one are English and maths, which are double weighted, which means that they count twice. Now with English, that could be either English literature or English language, if you take both, and they will take the highest grade for that group. Um, they will double, so they're double weighting whichever subjects you got the higher grade in. Group two consists of what are called the EBAC subjects. So these are sciences, computer sciences, geography, history, and languages. If there are any remaining spots to make up the eight, they would go to any other subject, the remaining GCSE subjects, um, the arts, vocational qualifications, and things like that. So each student is given an attainment eight score. And this is calculated by adding up their points for each of the eight subjects and dividing by 10. Now, it's divided by 10 because English and maths are double weighted. So essentially, you're getting 10 scores. And whatever that score is, that's then... Um, so what that is given as the attainment eight score. Um, however, the problem with this measurement is if students don't take eight GCSEs, all those remaining gaps, say a student took six GCSEs, so English, maths, double science, um, history, and language, those remaining two sub two gaps would have a zero score. So they would still divide by 10, even though they've only got eight scores. OK, so that means that children, students who take less GCSEs are actually disadvantaged because their progress, uh, sorry, their attainment eight score is going to be lower because they don't do the full complement of GCSEs. So it's quite complicated in determining um, how, that, that score. And what then happens is for a school to determine their attainment eight score, they take all of those scores for all of their students in that cohort, um, then divide by the number of students that they've got. So if, for example, they had 700 students in year 11, I know that's a ridiculous number, but hey, um, they, would they would add up all of those attainment eight averages and divide by 700, and that would give the schools attainment eight um, score. And again, that plays into league tables um, and other um, marketization policies. Now, if we look at the trends when it comes to attainment eight, they're not dissimilar from the raw GCSE grades. Girls still outperform boys, but in terms of ethnicity, what we see here is that Chinese Black African Pakistani Bangladeshi students are above average, Black Caribbean Romani and Traveller students are below average. But again, that gap is narrowing. And again, middle class students outperform the working class students. The next part of the EBAC scoring system brought in by Mr. Gove is next it gets even more complicated. And this is what's referred to as the progress eight score. So this is about seeing how much progress someone, the students have made from key stage two into key stage four. Um, because that shows how well it can be argued that that shows more how well the school is doing than it does how much what the final grade is. Now, the progress eight score is quite complicated to calculate okay so i'm going to take you through it but you don't need to know this for the exam it's just a, a kind of way for you to understand where these trends are coming from so in order to calculate a student's individual progress eight score what they do is they take the estimated attainment eight score 
which is um, based on prior attainment for previous year groups. So the average score for all students with the same score at Key Stage 2, and then subtract it from the student's actual attainment 8 score. So when you get your Key Stage 2 data, or when schools get that Key Stage 2 data, that's extrapolated to say, this is what they should achieve at Key Stage 4, based on what they achieved at Key Stage 2. Now, yes, I get that that's utterly ridiculous to say what you achieved at um, 10 will impact what you get at 16, but hey. Anyway, so what they do is they, that, that extrapolated score is then, they use that and minus what you actually got, and you're given either a, a plus or minus a, um, score. So it could be minus 0 0.5, plus 10 point, uh, 0.6. So if you have a plus score, that means that you have achieved, you have, um, achieved more progress than was estimated. If you have a negative score, you haven't made as much progress as you should have done. Okay. Um, and this is then used again to create a school's progress eight score, which is the mean average of all progress eight schools calculated, same way that they do the attainment eight. Um, now, usually the score is between minus one and plus one. Um, and if you're, for example, if you're a zero, that means you've made expected progress. So schools are obviously looking for a plus score because that shows that they're making that they're giving their, their students are achieving more progress than um, they than estimated. A negative score means that perhaps there, there's something not quite right there. And again, this will play into the um, league tables. And this can be done at both a school level and a subject level. But at subject level, it's referred to as value added. OK, so I will get and value added is done GCSE and A level, whereas progress eight is only done at GCSE. So next year, when you guys sit your exams, I will get a value added score after that um, exam series and to show whether or not I have added value to your education, whether you've achieved more than expected progress or less than expected progress. OK, now the problem with it at A level is if you've got a class where you have a lot of students with high grades, target grades, it's really difficult to add value, especially if you've got students, say, for example, who is um, targeted an A or an A star. I can't add value to somebody getting an A star because you can't get anything higher than that. So for that student, they achieve an A star. I still only get a, a value added score of zero. Okay. Now, this is all very complicated. And as I said, you don't need to know this ascent really for the exam. It's just useful information to know how the um, trends are calculated, because then you can bring in methodological issues when evaluating the trends. So what is the trend when it comes to progress eight? So in terms of gender, what we can see is, again, girls are achieving more progress than boys. And in fact, there is um, the amount of progress girls are making is almost equal to the lack of progress that boys are making. In terms of ethnicity, we can see that Asian and black students are making more progress. So they may not be getting the grades, they may not be getting the attainment, but they're making more progress. So they, they are, um, that's why the gap is closing. Um, mixed and white students are actually making, are not making as much progress, they're in the negative figures. Um, and when it comes to free school meals, free school meal students are negative and advantage students are in a positive. So again, the, the trends um, show, uh, or the way that progress is shown can be seen within each group. The final, so the final um, way that educational achievement is measured is through university placement. Um, and this is not to do with um, who is offered a place or who is um, accepted on a particular course. It's who actually turns up and enrolls. 
So this data doesn't come out until after enrollment has completed. So we're looking at maybe um, December, January time to see who actually enrolls in a university course. So what we can see from um, the data is that um, Chinese and Asian students tend to have higher levels of um, university acceptance and the lowest group tends to be the white ethnicity. Now the data in terms of gender and social class isn't currently available. Um, they tend to focus on ethnicity. But um, in terms of, so the percentage is the percentage of students who are offered a place compared to, uh, sorry, the number of students who are offered a place compared to the numbers who actually enroll. So again, this is not really used very much in terms of school um, league tables and things like that. Schools will boast about how many students they get to go to Oxbridge or Red Brick universities and things like that. But um, this UCAS data is more used at governmental level to see about um, the sort of students who are attending universities in the UK. But remember, universities are private institutions. They are not government um, institutions in the sense that they don't have to follow government policies in terms of education. They don't have standardized examinations. They don't have standardized courses. Um, a course in history at UEA will be different to the one taken at Oxford or Aberystwyth or Plymouth. OK, so it, this data is more a kind of let's see what's happening in terms of who's going to university type thing. So when we're explaining educational achievement, we, we need to look at both what's happening in school. So these are the internal factors, what's happening, but not just within school itself, but also the education system. Um, so that can include education policy as well as what's happening outside of the school. So this is things like home life, um, culture, um, and, and things like that, things that are happening that are not part of the education system. And we need to compare which ones have more influence. Now, if we look at what we, if we look at this a little bit more in detail, we will go into each of the factors and how they apply to each of the education um, groupings um, as we do them but the when we're talking about in the factors we've obviously we've got both the internal and external but there are some factors that can be both internal and external just to make it that little bit more complicated and that little bit more confusing for you so the sort of things we're looking at when we're looking at internal factors are things like the hidden curriculum quality of teaching the lesson setup, meaning how long is the lessons, how many lessons for each subject. Um, are you on a two week timetable or a single week timetable? How um, is there non negotiables within the lesson? We look at teacher expectations. We also look at the formal curriculum, and this will be looking at things like ethnocentric curriculum, feminization of the curriculum, and things like that, as well as setting and streaming. In terms of both. Um, internal and external, we can look at gender socialization, so how schools reinforce gender role socialization as well as how that comes from the home, labeling both at home and in schools, peer pressure, the location of the school, is it in a deprived area, is it in an affluent area, uh, pupil subcultures and how they can both anti-school and pro-school subcultures, but also more um, peer group subcultures, as well. And external things include things like income, parental attitudes, spoken languages, living conditions, things that you don't necessarily consider having an impact on a child's education, but can. Okay, but we're going into more detail about these when we look at the individual social groups. And as I said, we will be looking at both uh, looking at ethnicity, we will be looking at gender and we will be looking at social class in detail, looking at what the trends are the, and the internal and the external factors which can influence those trends and evaluating whether or not those trends are actually accurate. 